If you'll turn with me in your Bibles to Romans or on your devices, we're working our way through this marvelous book. We're in chapter 12. And today we're going to just be preaching on one verse and a teaser for next week you don't want to miss. And we hope our others will be healthy and be back. Next week will be how we are not conformed, but transformed. We're not conformed to this world. We're just spending the whole sermon on one verse this week and one verse next week. As you know, that's very unusual. We are going through this book of Romans, and usually we'll take a paragraph and we'll look at a subject. But these verses are so important. We're taking them one at a time. So what does this verse have to say. It talks about sacrifice. You know, today, making sacrifices is sometimes frowned upon. A lot of people want things right now. They don't want to wait. They don't want to save. They want to have things right now. But yet, I remember, and you remember, if you have um, saved for college yourself or for your children, and now my grandchildren, we make sacrifices. We'll put away some money for our children to help them not come out of college with debt. We will sacrifice some. We save and sacrifice for trips. I saved uh, to go on a hunting trip to Kansas with my two sons and had a ball. Cost a little bit of money, but I sacrificed to do that. You save to go to a Disney World trip with kids and grandkids. You've got to do that, right? We sacrifice and save to go on cruises, on big family vacations, go into the beach for a week. We love those events, and we will sacrifice for those events, won't we? But what does it mean to be a living sacrifice? And here we go. Romans 1, 12, 1, excuse me. I appeal to you, therefore... Brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Therefore, this verse pivots the entire book of Romans. It's the hinge upon which this door opens up now and the light streams in. We have been looking at the character of God all through the first 11 chapters and what God has done for us. Now this hinge and this verse therefore opens up this door and now we're to see clearly how are we supposed to respond to the character of God. And from here on through the rest of the book, Paul will be exhorting us, encouraging us to live a life to serve God. So this is truly a pivot, a hinge in this whole book. As we look back over the first few chapters, we what, what is this character of God that Paul is talking about. And he says, therefore, brothers. Brothers here means men and women. In the Greek word, that word means a generic brothers and sisters. He's talking to everyone. By the mercies, the key word, the mercies of God, the mercies of God, the characteristics of God. And we've learned through all of our work in Romans. In chapter 1, we learn that God is our creator. He is our creator. He created all things. The whole world can see this. And not only that, his gospel is the power unto salvation or the power for salvation. So God is our creator. God is all powerful. And we see that God is not partial and he judges rightly. He is holy. We are sinners. God is holy. He is a righteous judge. And then we see that we have all sinned. We are all sinners. Any one of us that says we're not, as Paul writes, we're a liar. 
We have all sinned. I am the chief of sinners, Paul writes in another book. I am the chief of sinners as I stand here before you. You know that. I've shared my sinful ways many times. We are all sinners. But here's the good news. The mercies, the mercy of God, the love that is everlasting, this mercy of God saves us. He, in, as we look in, verse, in chapter 10, we see that even while we are yet sinners, Christ died for us. God has love. He has mercy. And He will never change. And even though we are dead in our sins, we will be saved. As he goes on in chapter 10, he tells us, if we confess with our mouth, what? That Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart, in our heart, believe that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. We might not, it doesn't say you might be saved, we will be saved. He has provided that way through His Son. And He is our Savior. And this comes to a big climax in the verse just before chapter 12. Paul writes, he tells us that all the depths of the riches and the wisdom and the knowledge of God, how unsearchable are His ways. And then he says, for from Him and through Him and to Him are all things to the glory of God forever and ever. And then we come to chapter 12. So we see the character of God. He's our Creator. He is all-powerful. He is holy. He's the righteous judge. He is filled with mercy. And even though we are sinners, He has saved us. He is our Savior. Are His characteristics. Those are His, that's His nature. And this is the God that we worship. So often I forget I don't know about you, but I forget these wonderful character characteristics of God. I life gets in the way. I get busy, and I sometimes forget how great our loving God is. This came into focus this week when a good friend of mine in Blacksburg told me about some people I had had interaction with over many years and how they had come to him and ask, hey, does Dr. Bob, does he still lead a Bible study here? Um, and he said, no. Pastor Bob has gone to seminary. He's planted a new church, and it's in Parisburg. And they said, oh, well, we were looking for a church, and they are going to this gentleman's church, a good friend of mine in Blacksburg. And their story, they said, we have been apart. We have not been in worshiping our Lord for 30 years, three decades. And now a serious problem has come up and they want to come back to church, but more importantly, reestablish a relationship with the Lord that has been almost empty for 30 years. How could that be? Well, life got in the way for them. They were busy, career for the husband, work for the mom, children, going to college, all sorts of fun things. We want to have recreation. We want to uh, play golf. We want to go on vacations. We want to uh, go to all the football games. Our life is so full, God was missing for 30 years. Now, don't get me wrong. I have had wanderings. I've shared those with you. There are times in my life when, I, when life got in the way. And when we say life got in the way, what does that really mean? That really means my life got in the way, doesn't it? My life, what I wanted to do, that's what got in the way. It's not the world that gets in the way. It's us choosing to do our own thing 
and ignore the greatness, the character of God. So I have been in the same boat, thankfully not for 30 years. Thankfully for sometimes just a year or even a few months or even a few weeks. But life getting in the way means that our life, what we choose, takes priority over what God means to us, despite the fact that He is mighty to save. Nothing can separate us. He has all those characteristics. But I thank God that this couple has come back and is now seeking a relationship with Him. And the reason that they are coming back is unfortunately, the husband in this couple has just found out that he has terminal liver cancer and he doesn't have long to live. And thankfully, the Lord has called him back, even in this tragedy. We've been talking about trumpets in our Bible study in Revelation, how trumpets sound the, some of the judgments, but trumpets are also mercy, God's mercy. Trumpets are warning us, hey, get back on track. And this family had a trumpet call. Hey, things are falling apart here. Let's get back to our first love, Jesus. Even though we've been wandering for 30 years or 30 months or 30 days or 30 hours, our God is filled with mercy and restores us the second that we Turn to Him. Our God is all-powerful. He's our Creator. He's holy, a righteous judge, full of mercy. And through His Son, Jesus Christ, He's our Savior. So how do we respond to this great God with these great characteristics and this great mercy? How are we to respond. And that's what this verse opens up the door to look at. It opens up this door. And here is the answer to that question. By the mercies of God, present the command to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. God's character makes us capable to carry out His commands to present our bodies. There's a neat word I'm going to throw out at you. I don't um, like to play word games too much, but as I was preparing this past week, there's a word that I had never known before, and it really kind of makes sense to me. God's character capacitates His command. His character capacitates. Capacitate means just this. Makes us capable. What I just said. Enables us. It makes us capable of following His command. On our own, we cannot do this. But God's character makes us capable. Capacitates us to carry out His command. And that is through His great mercies, by the mercies of God. All through the Old Testament, if you love the Psalms and have read a lot in the Old Testament, loving kindness, what I just prayed about in Psalm 100, it's in Psalm 118, His loving kindness endures forever, repeated over and over and over in that Psalm. Loving kindness, has said in, in, in Hebrew, that, that word, loving kindness, translates in Greek to mercy or grace. So that same word used over and over and over in the Old Testament is this mercy, this grace of God that empowers us and makes, it, makes us capable of following His command. Because you see, that's the problem with self-help books, okay? You go to the, uh, when you look on, um, just Google, or not Google, type in Amazon, search, self-help books. 
Um, somebody did that. I can't prove it, but it's like 3.5 million. Okay. So 3.5 million books you can buy on anything you want to buy. I want to make my hair uh, brown instead of gray now. I want to do this through some sort of process. I can figure out how to do that. Self-help books. I want to lose weight. I want to exercise. I want to do this. I want to do that. You can find 3.5 million books that'll tell you how to do that. But what's the problem with that? What's the problem with me wanting to lose weight or me wanting to exercise more regularly? What's the problem? It depends on who? Me. And I am not dependable. We are not dependable. Everyone has New Year's revolu revolutions, resolutions, and we might have a revolution, I don't know. New Year's resolution. How long does that resolution last? All the way through January, if you're lucky? Maybe February? No way till March, okay? Because that resolution depends on you. And when I do things, it depends on me. And we are not capable and that is the key in this wonderful book of Romans. That is the key in all of the Bible. The commands are, of God are done through the power, through the mercies of God, the character of God capacitates us to carry out his commands. The character of God is who this command depends on. Not on me. The character of God is who undergirds us and enables us to keep these commands. The interesting thing about this command, what does it say? It says we're, to, it's our bodies, okay? Present our bodies, every, everything we have as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. So a living sacrifice, in the Old Testament, all these words, the word present, that word present means to give your offering as, to God at the altar, to present. That's exactly what that word means. We're to present our bodies as an offering to God, as a living sacrifice. Remember, Jesus, once and for all, in Hebrews as we've studied, once and for all, has gone to the cross. That sacrifice has been done. He has paid the price. We can't do any more. We are not to give our lives in sacrifice. Sometimes we might, as a martyr, if you're called to go somewhere that's very dangerous, you may give your life. But he is saying a living sacrifice that is holy, it means set apart, holy, called by God, and then acceptable to God. And that is your spiritual worship. Actually, a little bit better translation of that word spiritual is your true worship. Your true worship where you find God worthy. He is worthy to praise. That's what worship means. And we are to give our bodies. Notice this. This is really unusual. God is asking for the giver as well as the gift. He wants us, all of us, and our gifts, but He wants us. He wants the giver as well as the gifts. And that is what He calls us. That is our true and proper worship. That's our spiritual worship, is giving ourselves to God. 
A lot of times we do that on Sundays. We have wonderful music. We get caught up in praise and in worship and prayer. And we just give ourselves to the Lord in this room. And that's wonderful. And worship is a wonderful thing to do this morning, every Sunday morning. But worship doesn't end here. We're not to be just Sunday morning Christians, are we? Worship is to be every day, in every circumstance. We are to give our bodies to God, our all-powerful, holy God, who's the righteous judge, full of love, full of mercy, because the character of God makes us capable of keeping His commandments, of following His commandments. It capacitates us to keep those commandments. And we are to give our body as a living sacrifice. And that is our true worship. So how does this play out? What does this look like? What does this living sacrifice look like? Well, there is an example I'm not sure will follow, but there's an example in the Philippines every Easter in a town um, called Katud. I may mispronounce that. Sorry, Lena. 60 miles north of Manila in the Philippines. Every Easter, a group of people there will have themselves crucified. They put the nails right between the metatarsals there where it doesn't hit an artery or nerve, and they are nailed to a cross. And they're only up for about five minutes and they support their weight so it won't pull through. But they are nailed to a cross for five minutes. There are others in this group that will take long cords with glass and metal woven into it, just like the, the whips that, were, that, were, that Jesus was beaten by. And they'll beat their own back, walking and, and singing and chanting and praying. And their backs will get all bloody. And thousands of people go to this place every year to watch this happen. You may have seen it on social media, on even TV sometimes. They actually will broadcast this or show people being crucified at Easter and beating themselves bloody at Easter. Now, is that what these words mean, a living sacrifice. Are we to do that? I don't think so. I think this is a little off track. I don't doubt the sincerity, and I'm not here condemning. I'm just saying that the sacrifice that Jesus gave us on the cross is once and for all. No one else has to be nailed to a cross. No one else has to be beaten until they're bloody. Jesus did that. That doesn't need repeating. He did it once and for all as our Savior. God desires us to be a living sacrifice. And through His mercy, His character, He makes us capable to follow this command, to give our bodies and to give our lives as a true act of worship. And what that means is, as Paul just praised God, from all, from, through, from all, through, to all, we owe God everything. For from Him are all things. And to Him we are to give Him all things. And what that means is a living sacrifice is worshiping, yes, here, but worshiping every day. Giving ourselves. And that means some things that make us uncomfortable. Giving our time. Making worship a priority every Sunday. Being here to help with volunteering like we're going to do today to take down some... Uh, posters, so we're going to have some all of our hallways painted and our rooms painted this next week or 10 days. It means giving time in our events, volunteering, giving time helping in children with children's ministry, with youth ministry. It means giving time, and that is a sacrifice. 
because we have a lot of things we like giving our time to. It means giving our treasure. I just had a discussion with a friend the past couple of weeks that when we give our tithe, it should hurt a little bit. It should be a sacrifice and not just chump change. And I'm not going to preach on that too much in the sense that I don't think we are to hurt what God expects a sacrifice, which does mean we have to say, okay, I'm going to forego some new things. And I want to increase my tithe. I want to give more to the Lord because I am spending too much on myself. And I don't want to tell you, but you can just look at your smartphone. Look at my um, visa bill. I don't really want to share that with you right now. But you look at that and you'll see where my money went. And a lot of it went to me. Sacrificing to give our treasure to the Lord. Our talents in music, in teaching, in leading, in decorating the church, in sharing as a witness. Our talents, we are to give to the Lord because our God calls us. He wants us to give everything to Him. He wants the giver as well as the gifts. He wants our all our time, our treasure, our talents, our heart, our worship. He wants us to give us our all. And that's why we can do this. Because our God's character, His mercy, makes us capable, capacitates us to follow His command. And to present our bodies as a living sacrifice. And to truly worship Him every day of our life. So today, I call you, I call myself to worship Him. To present your bodies, everything you have, as your spiritual, your true act of worship. Pray with me.